Hello, photo pillars. Rafael the bar here. Welcome to another to another master class. Today we are with Rachel Jones, and she will show us her workflow to get the the perfect bucket list shot from concept <laughs> to creation. So, Rachel, welcome to the show again. Thank welcome you back. so much for having me back today, Rafa. I'm really excited <laughs> to be here. My last talk was really really fun. I mean, it was fun for me. I hope it was fun for all of you guys. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be back. And um, this time I thought I would do something a little bit different. It's gonna be a little bit more storytelling, but deep, deep dive into the inner workings of my mind as I chase through, you know, finding that perfect shot. Although I'm not sure if it's perfect. It's, it's very, very good. <laughs> I don't know if they're ever perfect, but um, it's something that I'd really wanted to shoot for a really long time. So I was going to share some of the story behind that and um, and kind of, you know, what landed me where I was and where I went to and and uh, really look at the planning. And then I was going to I'm hoping to give you an overview of the editing workflow afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit involved, so I can't do a full edit today, but I can kind of show you, you know, where I where I went with it and how I kind of put all of my ideas together. Wow, this is going to be amazing because it's not easy, you know, uh, to really uh, uh, see the complete workflow of a professional photographer like you are from the idea to actually take the photo and edit it. Yeah. So it's going to be it's going to be great and people will love it too for sure. So Rachel, you want to jump to the presentation? So Okay. We're going to start all right, so I do really, really well with questions. I, I love it when you ask questions. So hopefully um, people have questions throughout the talk and I and I don't mind um, answering those. Um, yeah, so feel free to jump in anytime. I will. All right, so, and, and for the viewers too, um, if you're joining us live, then jump in anytime. So the shot, um, this is a shot actually that I spoke to you guys about when I was on the first time. Um, this was sort of a bucket list shot for me. Um, it's out at Moraine Lake. And these kinds of conditions are really difficult to, to come by because um, as soon as it snows, the road to Moraine Lake is typically closed. It closes because it's a really steep mountain road. And as soon as it snows, then you get people, you know, going off the side of the road into the ditch. Um, and then as winter progresses, it becomes an avalanche risk. So you can imagine then that um, when the road is 12, it's actually 13 kilometers long, that it's really hard to get in there. Uh, you can hike in and that ends up being, you know, somewhere around 26 to 30 kilometers round trip, depending on, on where you go um, once you get to the lake. And um, getting in there in the snow can be a challenge. So you can bike in, you can hike in, you can ski in, but either way, you're probably going to be on foot to get something like this. Um, and then the conditions that I had here was Milky Way. I told the story about how I didn't get up there in time for sunset and it was really disappointing, but I got something that I thought was even better for me because I really am obsessed with the night sky. So, um, it's a, it's a real challenge to get these kinds of conditions at Moraine Lake. And the only thing that could be even tiny bit challenging or a tiny bit more challenging, I guess, would be to get Aurora out here. And the reason why it's super challenging to get Aurora is because this is a south facing location, as you can see with the Milky Way coming down the middle of the lake. And so that means that I would have to get like a really, really strong Aurora event, a really strong storm for the light at this latitude to swing south. So normally when we're chasing Aurora um, in the Rockies, we would be looking towards the north um, at a location where you can see the north sky. But to get Aurora in a south facing location, we just have to get a really, really strong storm. And that in combination with the road closure and oh, one more sweet little challenge about this is that once the lake starts to freeze, it freezes very quickly. Uh, that can be overnight, it can be in a day, or it can be in two days. And then once it freezes, you get the snow on it, and then you don't get that beautiful color, and you don't get reflections. So 
it's a real challenge to get out there in this super small window. And this year's challenge was I actually did get Aurora out here. So my story is about this chase and um, and what I ended up capturing when I when it when I got out here. Um, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't an easy story. So to begin with, um, I wasn't planning on going to Marin Lake at all. I was planning on going to the Yukon for some winter camping. I had been there the summer. I absolutely loved it. Just totally fell in love with the place. I'd been there camping in the backcountry for about 17 nights. And I really wanted to see what it would look like in, in the snow, you know, with everything kind of half frozen. But I had to come home and do some workshops. And once I was free, it was Thanksgiving here in Canada. So this is October 10th, 11th weekend. This is actually Thanksgiving at my sister's house. Um, and she lives at mile 47 of the Alaska Highway, which is in Fort St. John, British Columbia. So that's about a nine-ish hour drive from me. And I had planned from this point that I would just drive north to the Yukon, which was another 20 some hours. So, um, my plans got foiled a little bit though when I was looking at the weather forecast. So this is a, on the right hand side here, you can see a weather forecast for the Yukon. Um, the center image is where I had intended to be camping, that's where I was this fall. And um, the weather was getting extremely, extremely cold. So by extremely, I mean, you know, it was hitting lows of minus 22 with the wind chill at the particular elevation I'd be camping at, which is just a little bit much for me for camping, I think. Um, and also we had just a, a forecast full of clouds. So it wasn't looking very good for Aurora shooting and we had this, this pretty sweet Aurora forecast. I, um, it was a KP6, so for any of you Aurora nerds out there, KP6 is pretty strong. It'll start to swing south um, if you, like the lights will start to move south with a KP6. And then you never know, it could actually get to be more than a KP6. So ultimately, I was looking at the weather at home and um, it was a lot more clear skies and a lot more tolerable temperatures. And I, if I drove through the night, I could be there by the time, you know, for the next night for this Aurora because the Aurora impact was expected within 24 hours. So this is a little bit of my thought process. This is, you know, being adaptable, I guess, to the circumstances. I would have loved nothing more than to be in the Yukon in this place that just totally captured my heart. But the weather wasn't very favorable and um, I probably could have gone and toughed it out, but it would have been a bit of a suffer fest and likely not for very good shots. So I decided to go home and I had some friends meeting up with me. So I drove through the night. I stopped in Jasper for a two hour nap. I time-lapsed some Aurora that happened to be going over Pyramid Lake. I was hoping to uh, show you guys that, but it's not quite finished. So you'll have to check my social media at some point later and see uh, the Aurora I got while I was napping. Um, and so I slept for about two hours and then I started driving and I got super sleepy. So I had to pull over and have another nap before arriving in Lake Louise. So I arrive in Lake Louise at two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm meeting my friends at three o'clock in the afternoon. So I had just a little bit of time to double check the weather, double check the Aurora, double check my pack. And so here's some of my pre-trip planning. So what you're looking at right now is actually my plan for the Yukon while I was there, which didn't happen. But I wanted to give you kind of an inside look at how I plan trips. So this is just the notes function in my phone. Um, I like to sort of have an idea at a glance of what conditions I might, I might find at night. So, um, and by that, I'll get into this a little bit more, but I shoot right from blue hour into twilight into full nighttime. And sometimes, you know, if I get the right conditions with the moon or the right conditions with twilight, I have an idea of the shots that I can produce with that particular light at night. So I like to keep track then in my notes on my phone just to say 
okay, this is what time I'm going to see blue hour. This is what time I'm going to have astro twilight. This is where the moon's going to be. Um, if I have some good clouds or if there's, you know, something else going on, I, th these are my options for shooting. This is what direction I'm going to be facing. Um, this is what constellation I could be working with. So maybe it's Milky Way, maybe it's Orion um, or something like that. So I like to also look at what time the, say Orion or the Milky Way is going to rise or is going to set. So um, a lot, most of my trips are like this. You can even see in the beginning of this little screen, screen recording here that I had recorded the latitude and longitude. Um, and then I can look up, I can be very particular about looking at a weather forecast for that latitude and longitude if it's not somewhere that, you know, has a weather. Or I can look at, you know, using um, mountainweather.com, I can look at a particular elevation. So I get very planny, very, very planny about <laughs> my shots. <laughs> How much time do you invest in, in planning? Because it looks amazing. So much, actually. Um, it's a really big part of what I do. I think it's it's imperative to be prepared. It's so seldom that I rock up to a location and I just point the camera and get something magical. Um, when it comes to nighttime shooting, there's so much that happens at night and the light changes so very much that having an idea of what direction to look and what, what are the possibilities for this type of light and these constellations and this amount of cloud, uh, it just makes my shooting mm -hmm. better and better because I know what I'm looking for. And that's part of it, right? Is trying to figure out what is it that I'm looking for when I go out there. If if the best shot of the night is a twilight shot, that's the one that I want to get. So I'll uh, I'll show you some more examples here. But so this particular night out at Marine Lake, these are all screen grabs from that particular night. I was looking at uh, photo pills here. I want to know what time the sun was going to set, what time I would have blue hour. So I do a lot of blue hour blending for my nighttime shots. Um, not always, it, but if I wanted to get the cleanest possible image and I want to be able to print that image, um, and by cleanest I mean with the least amount of noise, then blue hour is going to give me some really great definition uh, um, in my foreground elements and I can blend in my nighttime sky with that. Most of the time I don't move my camera. For this particular shot, I did move my camera and I'll explain why um, as we go through here. But So I like to shoot blue hour, um, especially as like a backup. Let's imagine that it's a super dark night and conditions are changing really quickly. I just like to know that I have a really nice exposure of that foreground or of that landscape that I'm looking at that I can work with that's not super noisy or, um, you know, that I don't have to do really, really long exposures with. So I always plan to shoot blue hour, even if I don't necessarily use the blue hour shot in, in my final image. And sometimes I just use parts of it. So if I'm not moving the camera, um, but there's, you know, I can, I'll show you some masking and some opacity things with masking and brushing in, you know, bits of an image. But a lot of what I do is time blending. So mm -hmm. I sit for a long period of time in one location. I take lots of shots and then I blend those shots together to get a final result that sort of captures the broader experience of being out there. So um, my photo pills, this was, you know, what time I had sunset, blue hour, astro twilight. Um, I already know from having been out at this location before that I would have um, the opportunity to shoot Milky Way and it's late season Milky Way. So I did check that out. I think that's a little bit later. Um, but I also wanted to check and see what the moon was doing. So um, I pulled up the moon calendar in photo pills and then I went into the specifics. So you can see I had about, you know, a 36% waxing crescent. Um, and the moon rise and moon set times um, were in here. And I knew that the moon was gonna set um, probably before any aurora activity came out, but it's nice to have moonlight because sometimes you can use the moonlight as sidelight for a shot. So if it's not super, super bright or if it's not super high in the sky, whenever I'm working with moonlight, I think about moonlight like I, moonlight, 
the same way that I think about <laughs> sunlight. And that's when it's low and low on the horizon, it's a nice soft side light or, or whatever. As it gets higher and higher in the sky, then it gets it can get harsher and harsher. So I don't generally work with the moon when it gets very high. So um, when it comes to moonlight then, um, this is one of my all time favorite moonlight shots, also from Marine Lake. So I thought it was fitting for this presentation. But here, um, this is the screen grab here of PhotoPills. This is from the actual night that I was shooting. Um, this one is from a few years ago. I had a full moon in this shot, but the moon was rising behind this big mountain on the left and it underlit the clouds. So I got this nice sort of moonlight on the clouds. The shot was taken during astronomical twilight. So that's where the pinks in the image come from, because even though the sun is below the horizon, we get a little bit of residual color from the sun. And then if this image was a little bit bigger, or if I had just a little less cloud, you can see I've counted them. There's exactly seven stars in here. So there is stars. So it's astronomical twilight. Um, and because I had such a full moon, the stars are very faint and they're kind of washed out. But, you know, at first glance, it might look like a like a sunrise or a sunset or, you know, sort of just before sunrise or just before sunset. But it's actually astro twilight. There are stars in here. Hello. So one of the ways that I use photo pills is when I get shots like this, I will record what what kind of light did I get? And in this situation, I looked at the moonlight. I looked at what percentage of moon I had, where it was on the horizon, and um, you know what what time of night this was. So that so the shot that you're looking at was during astro twilight. And this little um, slider that you can see here on the left on my photopills screen grab is the movement of the moon um, from morning till night. And so you can see down here where it says light, it goes astronomical twilight. I'm just going to pause that there so it doesn't move. So I had a moon that was at nine degrees elevation during astronomical twilight. So in my sort of keeping track of when I get this light that's really special and that I get shots like this, the moon is between zero degrees and 20 degrees elevation. And, um, and it's during astronomical twilight that I get that sort of combination of this, the moon under lighting clouds and then the pinks from twilight and I still get stars. This is my favorite time of night to shoot. My absolute favorite time of night to shoot. It's um, amazing how you, how, how you plan the moonlight because uh, we are so uh, used to plan the sunlight, <laughs> but planning mm -hmm. the moonlight the way you do it, so yeah. you can repeat the same conditions or, or at least yeah. work to get the same results. It's amazing. Yeah. So there's a couple of caveats here. So the caveats mm -hmm. are this works best when we have a big moon low on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And so like a full moon or, you know, 80 percent moon works best when there's a lot of moonlight. And you can get this, you know, you can get the moon at this position. So, you know, between zero and 20 degrees elevation um, mm -hmm. during astronomical twilight, both at night and in the morning. And the sort of ideal times are around full moon. So a couple of days before full moon and a couple of days after full moon, you're going to get it either typically in the morning or at night. Now this totally varies depending on where you are in the world, mm -hmm. but I have actually shot this all kinds of places in the world and I've looked for this type of light and I, and I do find it. And I think it's, very unique as well, because the window for this is much smaller than if you were shooting Milky Way. If you're shooting Milky Way, you get two and a half, three weeks of time where you can, at some point in the night, get a Milky Way shot um, that's not too washed out by the moonlight. Whereas this, to get these sort of ideal conditions, it's really a small window, like maybe four to five days. And then mm -hmm. you also have to get the clouds. So it's not going to work if you have a completely blue sky that's just got some stars in it because there's nothing for that moonlight to reflect off of. Thank you. Yeah, did you have a question? I felt like there was a question lingering there. <laughs> no, 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 it's, I love it. Okay, so this is another example of that moonlight twilight. Um, and this one's taken in the Yukon from my summer trip. And the kind of super cool thing here was I got photobombed by the Aurora. 
So the green you're seeing there is Aurora. Um, this was this was kind of a cool shot. Um, this was totally a B shot. This was not something that I had actually planned. So this particular night, and I'm going to show you the time lapse of this one chatting with you. So this particular night, um, the weather forecast said I was going to have clouds, like a lot of them. But I'm looking up at the sky, and I'm you know we're we're camping, so I'm camping. I was solo. There was other people in the campsite. But I'm looking up at the sky, and it's I've got a clearing, and I'm thinking, okay, I would um, much rather be like out there trying to get aurora than you know whatever. And earlier that day, I had hiked about 20 kilometers. I was out scouting a location, and I found this this um, waterfall that just spilled down over the side of the mountain, and then it led into this scene of this such like a gorgeous impressive pointy jagged rugged peak and it was just like the epitome of of this location you know of, of this tombstone mountain range so um i had planned to go shoot there it was in like it was going to be another 12 kilometers of hiking it was a big day of hiking and uh, on my way there, I'm thinking, there is no way that I'm going to be able to set up two cameras at a waterfall and not sacrifice one of them to the, to the photo gods. So um, I decided that I would drop a camera off on my way and I would get, a, I would see what happens for like, a, you know, a B shot. So this was not my planned shot for the night. This sometimes just happens as well. But so I... Um, I dropped my camera off at this spot. I set focus using my Sony Commando remote. These things are really awesome. I'll talk about that more in a minute. So I found Infinity during the day um, using my Commando remote. Um, I shot the I shot the kind of fake blue hour. It was actually well before sunset. Um, so I didn't have any directional likes. I had some clouds in the shot, so I was able to kind of get that sort of blue hour look or feel. And then I just set it. I just guessed in my settings um, at what I would need for a somewhat cloudy night and um, and a lot of moonlight. I don't remember what my settings were off the top of my head. I should have made a note of that. But I just walked away from this camera. And then I hiked another, you know, whatever it was, five kilometers to my location, set up my camera at the at the waterfall. So I arrive at the waterfall. This is the best part of the story. <laughs> I arrive at the waterfall. I've been hiking like that day was an insane amount of hiking. I was absolutely exhausted. My feet were soaked. The only reason there was a waterfall there is because there had been so much rain for the last few days that it created a waterfall. So this was not something that was, you know, static or was going to be there for a length of time once it dried out. So I arrive at the waterfall and that's when the clouds show up and I literally just watched the cloud come in from the valley on the right hand side and it came in so fast. It was just like the hand of God just sort of reached out and was like, and just completely engulfed the mountain I was looking at from the time it took me to just pull my camera out of my bag, try to get it on my tripod, try to get a shot. I'm watching this thing roll in so fast and it just sort of like, consumed my mountain and I'm like well that was a grand hike you know so um I ended up like I waited a couple minutes and just was like okay well I better hike back in some amount of light which wasn't a lot because it was very stormy so I hiked back grabbed my my b camera and this is the only shot I got that night and it's because just of where I had left it um, but you can see, you know, in the time lapse, that storm rolling in and uh, it had it had some potential there for a few minutes. But I, I totally and completely missed the window on my plan shot. OK, so um, back to Marine Lake, back to back to our adventure. Um, so that night, you know. I knew if the Aurora wasn't going to happen, um, that at least I would get some Milky Way because I'd done it before and because Photopill says so. Uh, <laughs> so you can see here in the planner on the left that that night I would have had Milky Way uh, core visibility from 8.50 p.m. to 9.17 p.m. And truthfully, the core is like 
behind my mountain somewhere, but it's still, you know, enough of the Milky Way that I would still want to shoot it at this time of year, especially if I had some snow or ice at the lake. And the funny thing about Moraine Lake is this year they, they closed it early. They closed it um, the day before Thanksgiving because the snow was just a little too heavy and, you know, people were sliding into the ditch. So um, if I had, if, if all of this timing had been 24 hours earlier, I could have just drove up there and saved myself the 30 kilometers and, and, uh, and a night in the cold. And I would have had my vehicle there and I could have brought slider gear and like all kinds of stuff, but it is what it is. So this is what the weather was looking like that night that I was out for my shoot. I use windy and um, I love it because it gives me an opportunity to look at more than one weather model um, in the same program. I can compare weather models actually. And when I look at the cloud cover, I can look at all of the clouds or just some of the clouds. I can look at low, medium and high clouds. High clouds, um, depending on how thick they are, they sometimes you don't really even notice them um, for night shooting just because they're just so high and thin and, and wispy. So this is sort of a, this is what the weather looked like that night. I uh, was, I was able to screen grab this and um, you could see that it was very clear. All of these little hearts are all of my places in the mountains. So uh, <laughs> Moraine Lake is, is in this area here in the middle. And uh, yeah, so I can kind of look at the weather at a glance. I can see it, you know, where there's going to be clear skies Maybe there's going to be clear skies. Maybe there's not going to be clear skies. Where in the mountains, this you know, this last point is Jasper, and this this point here on this end is Kananaskis. So it's like the whole mountain range, and I just chase clear skies. So I do a lot of, uh, you know, change of plans. This is this is where <laughs> better for right now. For the moonshot, what's your favorite cloud type? Ah, that's a great question. I like about. <laughs> I like about 50% cloud. I feel like uh, Goldilocks, you know, this bed is this bed is too firm, this porridge is too cold. Um, but I like about 50% clouds. And I like a combination of low, you know, I there's nothing sweeter to me than seeing that sort of low, lazy cloud in, in the valley with the mountains peaking over top, kind of like that shot with a with the Milky Way in it. And then you know, some medium clouds and a little bit of high cloud because you need that, you need that to reflect the light. So a mix of clouds, you know, 50%-ish would be really great. It works with a little more and it works with a little less, but, you know, it's just like a sunrise or a sunset. If it's too cloudy, you don't get to see much. And um, if it's not cloudy enough, then it's not very visually interesting. Awesome. All right, so um, this was the weather from that night. Um, looking, first of all, uh, Mount Temple is just in that in the Valley of the Ten Peaks there. So I chose a mountain on mountainweather.com to look at. And this one, um, uh, mid-mountain at 3,000 meters, this was the forecast. Oh, I have, these, I have this in here twice. I actually had two, one higher and one lower, but um, that night it was expected to be clear and, um, you know, and tolerable temperatures. I think it got down to minus 14 Celsius. Um, this is an, another set of weather tools that I use, um, the uh, Clear Dark Sky. It's just a, a site online that you can go to and it can tell you, you know, what kind of cloud conditions to expect. And it's a different format than these other ones. But mountain weather is notoriously difficult to predict. So for me, I like to look at lots of different weather models and kind of make an educated decision based on that because they seldom agree. I mean, it's great when they agree that night, everything agreed that it was going to be a clear night. So I knew that I had a really good shot at getting the Milky Way. And then I had also a possibility of getting Aurora. Um, mm -hmm. This was the Aurora forecast for that night, I think. Yeah, that's for that night. Um, so a KP6 is when the when the aurora is actually going to start moving into like a southward direction or when you can see it in, in multiple directions, not just looking to the north at this latitude. Um, the further you go south, I was I was in California last week for a workshop 
and there was a forecast for a KP7 and people were like chattering that maybe it would get to a KP8 and I'm dying inside because I'm way too far south to see it anything other than maybe a green glow on the horizon <laughs> but as you move north and you get the ribbons and movement and all that crazy stuff and so um yeah, it was just, it was painful. And then it fizzled out. It did nothing. And I, and my, I, my severe FOMO was put at rest. But it happened again last night. We got crazy conditions. And um, it didn't actually materialized. But it was so cloudy here. I did go out to shoot. And then at midnight, I was thinking, okay, I have a presentation tomorrow. I need to be a responsible adult. Like, I can't show up, you know, like a hot mess and not able to articulate anything because I haven't slept, which is pretty typical. But anyway, so I did the responsible adult thing and went to bed last night knowing, and this is only, <laughs> I was only a responsible adult because there was so much cloud that I didn't think it was worth it to stay out. But I tried. I gave it a good try. Well, what's so, the name of the, the app you use for Aurora planning? So there's two here. Um, the one on the left is called Space Weather Live, and the one on the right is My Aurora Forecast. Mm -hmm. My Aurora Forecast is the one I suggest for people who don't really have any experience with Aurora chasing because it just kind of tells you. Um, let's see if I can play this video here. It'll, it'll tell you, okay, this is what the KP forecast is. This is the cloud in your area and the chances you can actually see something happen. Um, this actually might have been from last night. Sorry. And then the, the one on the left is the one that I use all the time. This one's called Space Weather Live. And the reason why it's so good is because it gives you the data in real time or real time kind of. So as, as those supercharged particles from the sun come hurtling towards Earth through space, they first come in contact with a satellite called Discover and discover reads you know the how fast the those little particles are traveling and and gives us data like this so i think i have another example yeah so you can see in real time then so for example what the solar wind speed is mm -hmm. and if i look at it right now there's actually an active aurora Oh, it just it just dropped down a little bit, but we're at a current solar wind speed of 611 kilometers per second. Um, so all of these little indicators are ways of determining whether you're going to get or like, you know, how what the potential is for that for mm -hmm. that Aurora. And um, they all of these indicators have to cooperate together. Getting one often isn't enough unless you're like you know, in Iceland or in the Yukon, yeah. where basically you just see it every single night, no matter what. Um, it's seldom that you don't see it on a clear night. But in in most other parts of the world, we have to we have to have <laughs> a little bit more um, activity going on to see it. Terry, did you have a question? Perfect. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so this was my real time data at the start of the hike. It actually didn't look all that promising, but you know, the forecast was the forecast was promising. And it's not like I could just wait with so with Aurora, it's like wind, you know, so you're looking for a certain set of conditions and you might only get that for 10 minutes. You might only get it for 15 minutes. And if you're not in position with a you know, with an Aurora forecast, then probably going to miss it if you have to hike for three hours, which is the case um, for this night. It was, a, it was a long hike, especially with lots of gear and it was cold. So, you know, we had to have a lot of extra gear with us. But um, so this didn't look super impressive, especially compared to even what's going on right at this very moment on if you look at uh, Space Weather Live. But I knew this something was coming. It had big potential. And I had this little window too, because, um, you know, the there was an aurora forecast, the road just got closed, so I knew the lake wasn't frozen. I knew there was a little bit of snow on the peaks. Um, I was able to be out there a week before and there was snow on the peaks. So I, I had a strong sense that even if there was no aurora, I would get a good Milky Way shot and I would get, you know, the sort of rare conditions that are hard to get out of the lake. So, so this was, um, so that's like kind of the planning that went into getting out there in the first place so now we're ready to actually get out to the field and 
guess what? There's more planning. So when I get out to the field, it's, well, first of all, you know, what am I bringing with me? So, um, bear spring, <laughs> that's my jacket strapped to the back of my bag. Um, my, my jacket, uh, I got really tired of being cold. And so was it two winters ago, I saw an ad for Fall Ravens um, expedition jacket and the advertisement was never be cold again. And I'm like, I want that. But this jacket is huge. It's in a compression sack and it's all squished down and the air is taken out of it. It's bigger than my minus 30 sleeping bag, um, but it definitely keeps me warm. So I had that with me. I had two tripods, two cameras, three lenses. Um, I had my water bladder inside the bag and that pack is my Atlas um, athlete pack. It's so wonderful. It fits me perfectly and I can get a lot of gear in there and it's just a really comfortable, comfortable fit. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, yeah, that's what, kind of what, what about the gloves? The gloves. Oh yeah. Gloves. Oh, so I'll just show you these. So I don't know if you guys can see me right now, but these are my gloves. Yes, um, they are. These gloves are made by the heat company. And mm -hmm. this is like, I, it's basically required equipment. If you come visit me for a workshop in the Rockies in the winter time. Um, so they have a, a built in liner glove and the liner glove has the touch screen pads on the fingers, which makes it yeah pretty good for, you know, finding the small buttons on your camera and being able to change settings and whatnot without taking your gloves off. So the biggest struggle that most people have is being able to operate their buttons without taking their gloves off. Cause if it's really cold, you can get frostbite in, you know, a couple of minutes. So you really want to be mindful of that. So your fingers come out and you can keep your fingers protected. And the glove is sort of, it's not sort of, it is water resistant and wind resistant. Um, and there's little pockets on the, on the top side of it that zip yeah. open. And you can put chemical warmers in there and chemical warmers can be a lifesaver. So especially for you ladies, I, if you feel me on this, it's like I don't produce my own body heat. I'm pretty sure that I might be cold blooded. If I don't absorb some kind of heat from my environment, I'm going to freeze. So, um, you know, sometimes the situation calls for chemical warmers. But these gloves, um, I've had multiple pairs of them. Um, you can get the the mitten without the built-in liner, so you can get them separate. I like these ones. So these are the Heat Pro 3, and you will never you will never have a problem with your fingers. And you'll be able to operate the buttons on your camera with a little practice. It's not like it's as easy as if you didn't have gloves on, mm -hmm. but um, it's totally doable with these. So they're really great. Um, and, then, and then if you're at a like really windy location, they have a, a cup to go around your wrist. And so if you, <laughs> if, you, if you are crazy enough to take your gloves off, they're not gonna blow away. That's actually happened before, so worth noting. But anyway, these are awesome. Beautiful. Must have. And, and the brand is? Sorry? The, the brand is... Uh, oh, the brand? Heat. It's the Heat Company. And the, the Heat, heat company, company makes the little chemical warmers to go inside as well. Um, and if you are buying chemical warmers, again, we're talking to you ladies, um, they have the ones that are the, like an insole and they, they go the entire length of your boot. And those can be extremely helpful in the cold as well. Um, I have a little story about boots after this i'm going to share with you but so i like brought my big jacket i had my thermal underwear on i had you know good base layers i changed my base layer when i got up there i was hiking got a little sweaty so i just took that one off and put on a dry one and um and then i like i had a proper mid layer and then i had my jacket so I was pretty toasty warm, even though it was minus 14, except, <laughs> except that I wore my hiking boots and I did bring chemical warmers and I was good for a while. And then I wasn't good. So I'll tell you about that after. But, so that's kind of what went into um, like getting up there. This is the, the shot that I was looking at. Um, this is actually the morning after I had shot all night. So what happened was when I arrived at the lake, uh, we arrived basically at sunset and we didn't have a ton of time to find a composition, but there wasn't a ton of snow on the rocks like you saw in that earlier photo of mine from Marine Lake. 
Um, there was some like little bits of ice along the shoreline. You could see that maybe there had been a little bit of freezing and then the movement of the water had pushed the ice up on the shore. And that's what I had planned to use as my foreground. And then <laughs> overnight, it was cold enough that the entire lake actually froze while we were there, which is why maybe my toes were not warm enough in my hiking boots. But um, yeah, so we were leaving and just as like, like right at the, the end of where we would hike out and be away from the lake, I found this foreground and I, this is pretty unusual foreground. So the lake is frozen and what you're seeing in the, in the center of the image there is actually methane bubbles. So the methane gas comes from like decaying vegetation and stuff that is um, bubbling up as the water, as the lake is freezing. And so these methane bubbles get trapped. And so we have this, uh, there's a lake here that's very famous for it. It's called Abraham Lake. And you can basically photograph the methane bubbles most of the winter out there because it's so incredibly windy that the, that the snow can't stay on the ice. But at a spot like Moraine Lake, if you're not there, like basically the minute that it freezes, which apparently I was this night, then, you know, a day later or two days later, it's going to be snow covered and it'll stay snow covered. So it was incredibly lucky to get um, the methane bubbles. And then the center of the image here, um, this is just some logs and they were just sort of fascinating and they trapped these methane bubbles within, within this frame and it kind of worked out perfectly. So this is the, this is the blue hour-ish shot that I ended up using. Um, you can see by the time I got my, got my cell phone out that there was a tiny bit of light starting to hit the peaks, which is a bit late for a blue hour shot, but I did get the shot before I got the cell phone out. So um, that's what I was working with overall. Oh, here's the rest of the, nice. the scenes. So you can see, you can see those methane bubbles um, and literally just the lake had just frozen. It was amazing to hear it, you know, lapping up on the shore for a while, and then it just got quiet, you know, and it seemed to happen all at once. It just got incredibly quiet. It was a pretty cool night. Uh, so, Rachel, 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 we have a, we have a question. Yeah. From Duncan Holland. How do you keep the camera battery warm and stop the lens misting up? Okay, those are two super fabulous questions. Um, I actually have a camera right here. So first of all, I shoot on a Sony. Um, the Sony, the latest edition of the Sonys, they have pretty big batteries. Uh, I mean, comparatively to their Mark ones and Mark twos, this is the Z battery. And the Z battery actually does pretty well in the cold. I changed batteries um, once in each camera. So I had two cameras going. And um, I would say that, so each one probably lasted six hours. I have shot at minus 20. Uh, Celsius and been able to shoot for six hours doing time lapse and that's roughly that night I'm thinking of it was about 1860 frames so depending on the camera and depending on how cold it is um, the Z batteries are really good but if it's super cold and I have another talk actually coming up that I was going to talk a little bit more about cold weather like really cold weather um, but if it's really cold, you want to keep your batteries like in a pocket next to your skin. So, um, or with a chemical warmer in it, the, the longer you can keep your batteries warm, the happier they will be and the more cooperative they will be. Um, so you want to keep the batteries warm and keeping them, you know, storing them next to your body is a good way to keep them warm. Once they're in the camera, um, I mean, people try all kinds of things. I've heard of people like sewing up little little cozies to put their camera in, stuff like that. I've never gone to those lengths. Um, if your battery doesn't last very long in the cold, you can get a battery grip, and then that means you can have two batteries in at the same time. But the cold is going to drain them. Um, you know, think about your car battery. If it's really cold and you haven't plugged your alternator in at night, you come outside in the morning, your car battery is going to die, and that's significantly larger than this. So um, keeping the batteries warm is really important. And um, your camera, the colder your camera gets, the harder, it ha the harder time it has as well. So there's that. And then um, a friend just bought me a lens warmer, actually, that I get to try out. I thought I had it right here, but I don't. I'm sorry about that. Um, and so basically, it's like a 
it's like a little Velcro strap that you can put around any lens and then it has a little controller and you can have it on low, medium or high. And mm -hmm. I haven't ever tried that, but I think it's totally worth trying um, to keep frost off the lens. Typically around here, you know, the winter is pretty dry. It gets cold and dry. It's not a humid cold environment. So I don't have a lot of struggle with the lens fogging up, but it does fog up and it actually fogged up this night. Um, it's not fog, it's, it's ice, like ice crystals were forming on my front lens element. So if you are in a situation where you have a um, little bit of ice forming on your front lens element, uh, try to use a blower to get rid of it instead of using a cloth. Because if you use a cloth, the warmth from your fingers, hopefully your fingers are not frozen, is going to melt that, that ice on your lens and then it'll smear because you'll get water and then you'll have like a nice smear circle and it's just really hard to clean it. So use a blower where possible. So hopefully that helps. Yes, thank you. Okay. So this is um, this is my Milky this is Milky Way planning. I didn't do these screen grabs um, while I was there because I was too busy running around like a crazy person trying to find a composition for two cameras. Um, so I'm using one from a previous example, but you can go into the planner in Photo Pills. So this is under Pills and Planner, and then you know again looking at when I'm going to have visibility of the Milky Way. Um, this is sort of pre-planning. I think I showed you the pre-plan for Moraine Lake. Mm -hmm. But then you can also use night AR when you're out on location and you can see how the Milky Way is going to line up with your subject. It works really awesome. Um, I use it all the time. I did, didn't use it that night because I've, I've been to that location a million times and I know exactly where the Milky Way is going to be. It was going to be a little bit off to the right um, given my time of year. But um, yeah, I don't know if you guys have noticed this yet, but I use photo pills for everything. It's really, it's in every stage of planning. So if, so people always ask me like, what, you know, what's one piece of gear you can't live without? And this little app, you know, this little app is the one thing I can't live without. I use it for pre-planning. I use it once I'm on location. Um, I use it for spot stars, which I'm about to show you and figure out how like long my shutter is going to be and all kinds of stuff. So. It's just an incredibly helpful tool. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, um, so I arrived out on location and I found I I found a composition and I happened to be there, you know, in in enough time that I was able to see it in the light. Although, you know, it was we were quickly shooting blue hour um, because we got out that got out there a bit late. Um. So if you were to arrive at night and you can't see anything, Sony cameras have an amazing little function called bright monitoring. And I'm not sure if I showed this before, but basically it's a custom button that you have to program and then you just turn it on and you it allows you to see your scene at night. So this isn't a shot, this is the live view of my camera. Yeah. And so what happens is when you use bright monitoring, some sort of little magic happens inside your camera that boosts the internal gain and it allows you to see as if you had like, you know, as if you had night vision. So it's pretty cool. Um, and I use this a lot for trying to find a composition if I arrive in the middle of the night. But it's also really useful for just knowing where does your Milky Way line up in this shot? Because you can actually see the Milky Way in relation to your to your shot. So um, it's a it's a cool little feature of a Sony camera. It's only on Sony cameras. Um, so if you do shoot Sony, it's one of those things you have to program in. And um, if you're curious about that, I do have a set of instructions on my website. So you can visit my website and um, there's a little write up there of how to program it. By the way, Rachel, we forgot to add to, to say your website. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's astralistphotography.com and I will show you uh, a, like a screen at the end so you can go on and check out what I'm up to lately and um, workshops and stuff that I offer. Cool. All right, so photo pills, um, when I am actually in the field and I am trying to figure out how long I'm going to leave my shutter open, I start with the spot stars function. So in the pills you have spot stars and this is basically an algorithm that's going to allow you to figure out based on your camera, your camera sensor, your focal length and your aperture, how long is the maximum amount of time you can leave that shutter open before you begin to get little trailing or little streaks in your stars. 
And I'm all about those pinpoint stars, so I tend to lean towards the accurate, like accurate number. So there's two different settings here. So right now you can see I have the Sony A7S III plugged in and um, at 12 millimeters and f2.8. So the two different settings I would get would be the default, which would be barely noticeable star trails. I could leave my shutter open for 27 seconds. Um, and the accurate on the Sony A7S III is half of that time, so 13 seconds. And that's gonna get me those really sharp pinpoint stars. This works every single time. <laughs> um, they also list the 500 rule down here. This is a pretty antiquated rule. It really doesn't work for our cameras anymore. Um, it worked back in the days of DSLRs and probably film, but our cameras are um, a lot more sensitive to light. They're like mini little supercomputers, and um, and you and you need to use a different different rule. So um, the NPF rule is the one that I go by all the time, and I typically shoot in at at the accurate setting, unless I'm doing time lapse or something like that, then I might switch to the default because if you're if the stars are in motion, like they will be in a time lapse, you don't really notice if they're a little bit elongated because they're moving across the screen. And so this setting would allow me to have a little bit more light on my overall scene and a little better exposure um, and a little less ISO. Whereas when I'm shooting for accurate stars, there's techniques I can use in post that allow me to stack my images for noise reduction and stuff like that. So I can use really, really short shutter times. And by really short, sometimes they're a second, sometimes they're two seconds. So it really depends on the focal length and the aperture and what camera you're using. So the A7S III is gonna let in a lot more light than my A1 um, and they're gonna have different settings. So once I'm out there, I always, always, always check photo pills for my camera and my lens and my aperture. Lots of these values I have memorized now, but I find that just super helpful. So the next thing you need to figure out is focus. Um, and I do a lot of focus stacking. So focus stacking is just taking like, um, like a multitude of shots focused at different points throughout the image but the settings stay the same. And then I combine those in post so that I can get a shot that's perfectly sharp all the way through from my foreground, which is really close to my camera, all the way through to my background. And that's really important when you're shooting um, wide open at night. So, you know, if we're out there for a nighttime shoot, we're probably gonna be shooting at F2.8, nice wide open aperture to let the most light into the camera. But when we're doing that, that means we're gonna have a really shallow depth of field. And, if my foreground is going to be in focus, then my stars are going to be out of focus at f2.8 if I'm trying to get it all in a single shot. So I always focus stack, and that just means taking multiple shots, all at different focal points, and then blending them together in post. I have a little example I can show you after. Um, so this is just a little demonstration of using the Sony Commander remote for that focus stack. Um, it's really easy. I start by putting finding my focus in my foreground. So I know exactly how close to the camera I need to focus. The camera is in auto and the lens is in auto. And I go ahead and I take my shot there. After I take my shot, then I switch the camera into manual focus and I leave the lens in auto focus. And then I can just use either the plus button or the minus button, depending on which direction I'm working. In this case, the plus button to move my focal point just a little bit um, through the image towards infinity. And so here I'm shooting at f2.8. So I need lots of different, I need lots of focal points because it's a really wide aperture. So I need more images to stack. Um, but then I can use the little focus scale that you saw at the bottom to show me, you know, where I focus. So I'm just going to back that up a little bit so you can see the focus scale. Let's see. There. So right there, you can see in that sh in that part of the, the frame that I had found infinity, whereas earlier I was at, there's 157 meters. So moving forward, I can find infinity. And that's how I found my infinity focus when I set up that camera and I just left it uh, to shoot that gorgeous stormy, twilighty, moonlighty shot of Aurora in the Yukon. Um, and I time-lapsed it, that's what I did to find my focus. And I just found infinity using the commander remote and did a little focus stack 
and the rest, the rest, the camera did for me. <laughs> so this is really good for finding focus at night. Um, I know lots of people struggle with that. Uh, so here's what it would look like if you were focus stacking in the dark, you're looking at the back of a screen. It's, you know, it's obviously really dark. I turn on um, interval shooting so that I don't get the blinky orange light when I'm when I'm sitting next to somebody. So that's just a, a trick for you Sony users. Uh, if you set your interval shooting to do one shot at a time with a one second start time and uh, and a, like a one second interval, but it's just one shot at a time, then it turns the the focus illuminator off on the front. So your autofocus illuminator, which that blinky orange light, you can disable it by turning it into autofocus. So um, yeah, it can be tough to find focus in the middle of the night um, when you can't see very much. So once I do find focus, so here I'm actually just focusing across the lake um, at the town of Banff. There's some lights there and I focused on those. So I found my infinity focus and then just turning the focus wheel, I can actually work my way back to my foreground. So that's how I would focus stack in the dark without a remote. But it's the same thing. It uses that little focus scale to show me where I'm focused and I can bring it all the way to the foreground. And then when I'm on the foreground, I can just make sure that um, I'm shining a light and it, getting my very last image um, with a light focused on the foreground so that I can make sure that I've got the entire stack from back to front or from front to back, depending on which direction I'm using. For people who have a difficult time focusing, there's a, a filter you can get by Lonely Spec and it's called the Sharp Star. I think they have the Sharp Star 2 now and um, basically it's, it's like a little plastic filter that slides down over your lens and it creates diffraction on your star. So you get a star that looks like an X. And then as you turn the focus wheel into focus, you get this, this um, light bar that will intercept that X, which is super, super cool. So you know exactly that your lens is in focus. Um, whenever I am product testing, like if I get a new lens to test, that's what I do to make sure that my focus is tack sharp because I would never want to write a review on a lens that, you know, and be like, oh, this is, yeah, and it was a little soft in the corners or whatever, and then find out that it's like user error, right? So, um, <laughs> so if I want to be very, 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 very precise and I want to make zero mistakes, I will use this this one by Lonely Spec. It's amazing how smart uh, Ian Norman and Diane Southern are with uh, Lonely Spec blog and all the equipment they produce. Yeah. Um, all right. So capturing the Aurora, um, every single photographer I've ever met ever, as soon as the Aurora starts to move and dance, they get super excited and they forget everything they know about photography, everything. So it's like, what settings do I use? And there's a lot of panic, you know, they can be really seasoned photographers, but it's just sort of a special thing to see. It's not sort of special. It is really special. Um, and because it's, moving and changing and everything's happening really quickly, you know, it's easy to get a little bit panicked about it. So typical settings for Aurora would be, you know, a shutter time of anywhere from two to eight seconds. So I always start with my spot stars and photo pills and I want to make sure that my stars are not elongated because if they're streaky or elongated, my shot to me is already ruined before the Aurora gets introduced. So I, I start with spot stars and I know that I'm going to be shooting at a wide open aperture to let as much light in as possible. So probably shooting at f2.8 and then ISO, I say on here 3200 or less, but really it just depends on how bright the Aurora is. So if you get a little low band on the horizon, ISO 4000, 5000, 6400 you might need, but typically if you have Aurora that's dancing and moving, you're going to need um, a much lower ISO, somewhere around 3200. And it could be even less if there was moonlight. So if there's moonlight in your shot, you know, you have more ambient light to work with. So the Aurora and the moonlight is going to totally determine, you know, what your final settings need to be. But you're probably going to be working at a wide open aperture. You're likely going to be somewhere between two and eight seconds. Um, but if it's really moving and really dancing, you might be at a fraction of a second. So you might be at half a second. 
It just really depends on that combination again of light and movement. And then ISO 3200. Um, this one, the foreground image is actually stacked at night during, uh, during, um, during the aurora. And I had a lot of moonlight, so I was able to stack it at F8 for 30 seconds, um, ISO 3200. And then, um, and then my stars were F28, six seconds, ISO 3200. Hmm. So this is a final shot from my night um, out chasing the lights at Moraine Lake. Um, the, the aurora actually did swing south, but it only happened for a few minutes. If I were to, if I were to have looked, I mean, I did, I had a second camera set up to look north. The light show was just crazy. It was dancing, it was moving. And yet this is the image that I chose to put together because it was true to my experience of what I saw. You know, that, that aurora was just enough to swing south. Um, it came in front of the Milky Way, which is also sort of unusual. And getting the whole set of conditions, um, the lake that froze and didn't get snow on it, getting the methane bubbles and all of this stuff, it really came together um, in, in quite a unique way. And so using the, the editing techniques that I use, I could have just used my like pop in sky from behind me, but this one, this one really captured the experience for me. This is actually when the Sony, one of the Sony cameras was released a couple of years ago, um, they, they had this, um, this was part of their promotion, go because you mm -hmm. have to go. And it really spoke to me. And I feel like, you know, these nights where we are willing to stay up all night, even though I drove the night before and had three hours of, and only had three hours of sleep in my car as I worked, cause I had a time lapse going. Um, and then I hiked 30 kilometers and I sat there in minus 14 watching this lake freeze and my toes. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of passion behind that. There's a lot of drive behind that. And I thought that what they, what they said was it really resonated with me. So when people ask me like, you know, <laughs> why, why did you do that? It's just an image. It's, it's because I have to, it's because it's the thing that keeps me up at night. It's the thing that I dream about. And, um, and this shot is something that I had thought about for years and years. Like, wouldn't it be amazing to see Aurora over the snowy peaks at Moraine Lake? Um, but before that, you know, before the lake is covered in snow and it's just such a rare event that the event or this window of time was only about 12 hours and all of these things had to converge at the same time to get this shot. So, the light, the Milky Way, the methane bubbles, the frozen lake that's not snow covered, the snow on the peaks. Like there was only a very, very short window of time when this was even possible. And being out there was a combination of knowing that these that this was a possibility, you know, because I knew the location, I knew the conditions, I knew what to expect, I knew the alignment of the night sky, I knew I understood the aurora forecast. There was a lot of stuff that went into this. And, um, and it became possible just because I was willing to take a little bit of a risk. And the risk here is oh, my toes. And, um, and the fact that, you know, here in the Rockies, we're going to have a much better, brighter, more like spectacular show looking to the, to the north. And this was south facing. And so the south facing location, I knew that the Aurora, if it swung south at all, <laughs> it wasn't going to be it wasn't going to be the same as if I was looking north, you know, it wasn't going to be that the same impact and the same dancing and swirling and everything, but it all really came together for me. So this is the shot after all that planning and all that hiking and all that, you know, the cold toes. So the story, about the, cold, <laughs> story about the cold toes. So the next morning, uh, so we were getting pretty tired, you know, obviously I didn't sleep the night before more than a couple hours in my car. Then we hike, and it's a, a long hike, like we hiked for like three hours. And then, you know, there's a lot of excitement because when it did actually happen, we were like hooting and cheering and like just my excitement level was off the charts. And so adrenaline's high, excitement's high. Well, by four o'clock in the morning, I'm in full crash mode. I am so tired. Like I'm so unbelievably exhausted. 
but I'm determined to stick it out till blue hour because everything changed so much over the night. So when I got there, that there was like waves lapping up on the shore. And when I left, everything was dead still and silent because it had frozen. And I wanted to make sure I had a blue hour shot of that just so that I could, uh, you know, so I had some creative room in post to bring the shot together. So I'm determined to wait for a blue hour and I'm exhausted and I, and I just, found a rock to sit on, it was cold rock. And uh, and I was just like flopped forward and put my head on my knees and I had a little nap for like an hour. And in that hour, I wasn't moving. I wasn't running between the two cameras. One was at the lake shore and the other one was up on this, on this uh, well, we call it the rock pile. So it's like a nice little steep, steep but short um, hike, enough to get your blood flowing. Well, my blood was not flowing while I was hunched over and, and drooling on my own knee. So, you know, I got up and I didn't realize that I had gotten as cold as I did, like in terms of my feet. So my chemical warmer stopped working at some time in the night. I had a second set, but I, I didn't feel cold, so I didn't change them. I thought I was okay. I was not okay. So we started leaving the lake and, you know, got this, this blue hour shot. And I was so excited. And then we started walking. And as the blood kind of returned to my toes, they were on fire. They hurt so bad. And I was like, genuinely worried that I had just done damage to my feet, right? And I had just finished my wilderness first responder course. Like I did a renewal of it. And of course, at the very end of the wilderness first responder course, we cut, we had a big section on hypothermia and frostbite. And frostbite is terrifying because, you know, you get it, you can lose, you can lose your toes, you can get these horrid blisters. And it's like, I really, I just, it's not something I want to experience. Okay. So, um, you know, I had these really fresh visuals of big blisters having to be drained by needles and stuff. And I was terrified for my toes and, uh, and they were, they hurt so bad. So I had a little bit of a knee jerk reaction after that. I went and bought myself some boots. These boots are ridiculous. Um, you probably can't see, but behind me here, this is the case that my boots came in. I'm just going to slide this up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. See. yeah. <laughs> it's a Pelican case. Um, so, they're, I mean, they better keep me warm on the moon because they were a little expensive. But, um, yeah, they're like, so when I, when I had a choice between white, black, and red, and I was like, white, definitely white, you know, and then I can be like one of those, you know, super cool, like <laughs> super spies, you know, that you see in the movies with their, not that I have a sniper, I don't know, photographer, but I just wanted the, I wanted the white boots that I was going to get a white jacket to match. And, uh, and then they arrive and kind of look a little bit more like stormtrooper boots, don't they? Don't I look like maybe I could be a stormtrooper? Yeah, lovely. They're, they're lovely, but that's what happens when you get cold. It's like, uh, so now, you know, I, I don't know. I spend enough t time outdoors and I really, really, really do not like being cold. So I went and got these ridiculous boots. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> we have any questions if you. Yeah, mind, yeah, please. Yeah. I'm starting to run. I'm starting to run long here. Yeah, yeah. We, we have a cross MOBA. Says Rachel, the pictures you've shown show your passion and your story. How much do you ignore technical perfection for the sake of capturing your experience? Ah, uh, okay. So I'm a little bit I'm I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. I really I strive hard for the technical uh, precision. I guess you would say, and. Um, you know, that's why I use Sony gear. That's why I use, that's why I do so much planning. That's why I'm so precise about settings and, um, and the editing and, and whatnot. I don't know if I always hit the mark that I'm achieving or that I'm, that I'm aiming for, but I'm always trying to hit that mark. Um, so I, I guess the short answer would be, I try not to sacrifice the technical side for the creative side, because I think that when you nail the technical side, you get the, the creative vision. So this is an example of that. Um, actually, the, the stars in this image, I think I was a little on the underexposed side. Just It was a super long focal length and shooting really high ISOs. I think I was at 16,000 ISO here or something like that. Um, 
But I think that the more precise you can be, the better the image is going to be. So the more technically sound your techniques are, the more the more you're able to actually follow through with that creative vision and get what the shot that you're looking for. Uh, great, thank you. Got any wow. other questions? Uh, yeah, we have a Rebecca Brothers. How do you choose which Sony camera to use for which circumstances? That's a great question, actually. Um, I think about that a lot. I have used all of the Alpha line. I've used them all at night. And um, and sometimes I reach for my A7S III, and sometimes I still reach for my A1. So my A1 is 50 megapixels. And with a higher resolution, you're going to have a harder time managing the noise. With lower resolution, like the A7S III is only 12 megapixels, you're going to have an easier time because there's going to be much less noise. And the reason being is they have the same size of sensor, but 12 megapixels, each, each megapixel is larger and can gather more light. Whereas at 50 megapixel, each one is smaller and can gather less light. Um, this time lapse that you're seeing here is actually kind of a cinemagraph. Um, this was shot on my A7S III and it's just going to allow me to let more light into the camera. So anything time lapsing, I'm using my S3. And there's, um, if I'm doing any kind of stacking for noise reduction, so working with single images, I can do that on the S or I can do that on the A1. So it really depends on how I plan to process it. And I usually have a plan for my editing while I'm shooting. I, I already know how am I going to put this together? What techniques am I going to use to, to kind of bring all these ideas together? So the short answer to that question is you can use any Sony camera and get great results. Um, especially if you're doing things like blue hour blends with stacking for noise reduction in your sky. But there are times when I would reach for a lower resolution camera um, to get to let more light in. Um, one would be time lapsing. And I actually just ordered the Sony A7 III like six days before the A7 IV came out. But I ordered the A7 III and I'm having it modified um, at Spencer's camera in the US for um, more deep space stuff. So one of the things I want to spend more time doing this winter is photographing the, the gases and the nebulosity around mm -hmm. Orion and stuff like that. So I'm having an infrared modification done to that camera. And that camera is only 24 megapixels. But again, it's going to be really good for that low light, more deep space kind of stuff. And at 24 megapixels, there's a lot I can do with that image. And now um, I don't really worry about resolution too much because there's programs like the Topaz, um, what is it called? The, it's a Topaz AI, um, uh, like a, now I'm getting two names confused. I think PhotoPills has one called Gigapixel and the Topaz has one, but basically you can take a low resolution image and, and blow it up really big. And it does, the AI software does a really good job of that. So, um, yeah, I can I can use any camera just about, but I kind of reach for the lower resolution cameras or more really dark sky stuff or, um, you know, special projects like time lapsing. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Any other questions? We have two more, but I think I'll wait so you can okay. move forward a little bit. All right. So I'm just going to exit out of this for a minute. I kind of want to show you the back end of the editing because I did promise that. Um, we're in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you an overview of the editing, actually. So let me just pull that down. And I have photo pills here. So, or sorry, photo pills. Everything's photo pills today. <laughs> I have Photoshop. Um, so this is my final image in Photoshop. And um, I just wanted to show you kind of I guess where I started and where I ended up with that. So this is my sky shot. Um, when the Aurora first appeared, <laughs> it actually, it actually is so bright that there's a lot of reflected light on the mountains. And it looked like the Incredible Hulk threw up on the mountains and it turned this like atrocious green color. That was the first thing I saw. I'm like, oh the Aurora's here. <laughs> I really hope 
I hope beyond all hope that the, the actual bands in the sky swing south because right now I just have really green mountains. So these are my Hulk Smash Mountains. Um, the light's kind of coming down this like valley opening behind me into the left. Um, that's where the, the like reflected green is coming from and that's what's lighting up the mountains. And um, the color that you see in the sky, um, the reds are from Aurora and the greens, I only got the reds in a handful of images and I time-lapsed basically all night. So I time-lapsed for the time-lapse function, but I also just kept the camera running so I could capture all, you know, as many opportunities as I could of that sky. And uh, this is one I really liked just because, you know, I got some of the red in there and I got some of the greens. Um, I've already toned these down a little bit. Uh, and then I wanted to blend it in with my blue hour foreground. So um, I bring in my blue hour foreground. I brought the ground down a little bit um, from where I actually shot it and combined it with that sky. But you can see at this point, it doesn't really quite blend together yet, even though I've done a little bit of work on the raws. Um, when I brought each of these in as layers, I, I use smart objects so that I can go back and forth between camera raw and and my my basically my layer and make small adjustments so that I can bring the sky to be more in line with the foreground. Um, actually, this is a better shot of so there's the sky that I used and there's the ground that I used. And this is what they started to look like as I brought them together in Photoshop. So then the next thing I do is try to work on the color a little bit. So um, for that, I started with um, Nick collection, actually. Uh, it's just a collection of filters that um, apply to the entire image. But it's a nice thing to play with or to start with. And there's also, you know, you can adjust contrast that way. And it's a fun little program. So if you don't have it, um, I do recommend it. So I did a little bit of color work there. These are actually not all Nick layers. There's a lot of different adjustments going on here in, in Photoshop. And then I use um, a gray adjustment layer uh, and I start working in the light. So basically what I do here is I create a new layer by holding down the Alt key. This is option on a Mac and um, I select the new layer icon. And then I would choose soft light under the mode and check the box that says fill with 50% gray and then um, now I get a new adjustment layer. So if I double click on my color panels down here, I can go ahead and choose a color from the image. So here's, you know, this is the, the aqua color that I had toned the Aurora to be, um, or I can choose that, that um, the pinks and purples up there. So let's say I choose a green. I think I ended up using like a much darker shade of this green. Um, so something down here and then I start, I used a brush, just my brush tool with a low opacity and I start bringing in that color. I'm just going to do, I'm going to do it at a really high opacity so you can just see what it does, but I can start bringing in that color on my foreground. So that's obviously way too much, but I can start working in the color. Um, if I have done too much, I can actually just change the opacity of that layer and I can reduce it. Uh, I'm just going to delete that. But so that's how I bring the color in from the sky and bring it into the foreground because I shot the foreground at blue hour. And so all of these little layers are just small, small, small adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, doing a lot of dodging with color using the color brush and uh, ultimately I arrived here. So that's kind of an overview of how these images came together in Photoshop. And uh, I had it open earlier, but I was afraid it would just crash my system. I wanted to show you the RAWs, so I'm going to open up Bridge, and then I can show you the RAW files as well if you're curious about that. Although I kind of feel exposed when I do that somehow. Like <laughs> this, is, this is the inner workings of my brain. Um, so I did. I shot a lot that night. Uh, this is what they look like before any sort of adjustments whatsoever. I really struggled with the white balance out there that night. It was 
so green no matter what white balance I chose. So I knew I had to do a lot of work in post, but doesn't that look like the Incredible Hulk just threw up on the mountains? <laughs> Every time I every time I look at that image, all I can think is Hulk smash. So, yeah. anyways, that's kind beautiful. of what it looks like. <laughs> totally, it's so beautiful. It's so it's so green, and that's because there's it's so much reflected light coming from the north. Like the, the lights were so strong, and it hits the mountains first before the light actually moved to the sky. So I can show you what the sky looked like. Um, Let's make sure I'm in the right folder here and then come down a little bit. I'm not turn my phone off. Sorry about that. Uh, so these ones were ones where I had more, you know, more of the Aurora kind of coming directly into the shot. And I, I couldn't stand the, the super green. I really toned them to be more into the aquas and the blues. Just, I, it's just a color preference for me. Um, I could have left them as, as a lot more green, but I felt like the tone of the image, just the tone of the night, the feel of everything, coolness, my freezing cold toes, it all just felt right to to use a lot more of the sort of aqua tones there instead of the more greens. And so to get rid of those, you can see here my color temperature. I did other color adjustments, but I changed the temperature a lot. I went down to 3150 and, um, and I added on the on the tint it's up to 22 so if i go as shot um i shot these at 4300 kelvin that's like typically a really good starting place for a white balance at night but i didn't love how you know well a it was super green <laughs> just so much green and then the sort of purple tones there so that's why i ended up choosing a more custom custom kelvin Custom color temperature. Um, so that's what that looked like. And then the foreground thing, you know, I actually did search in the night for different foreground, um, but it didn't truly freeze until the wee small hours of the morning. The, the probably the ones where I was drooling on my own knee. So I was just really lucky to be able to catch these these methane bubbles and and this formation before I left that day. Yeah, the, the, so, whole, yeah. the whole image is, is amazing. It's something dreamy. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. It's so funny that I can, you know, there's so there's just so much that goes into, you know, that one tiny little, that one little image, you know, that I, well, I'm probably going to do something with it, but I don't know. Uh, it seems crazy to drive all night, sleep in the car, hike, stay up another night, like two nights in a row, a minus 14 Celsius, get the coldest toes ever, you know, just to go through all of that and have one image that I really love. I actually do have some different um, foregrounds. I just don't like them as much. So I like everything in comparison it just seems to be like less. I don't know. Maybe I'll edit some more images from that shoot another time, but that's where that's at right now. Well, with all the adventures you live and all the great images you capture, uh, you know, it's normal that you know your workshops fill up so fast. <laughs> yeah, so well, that's a that's a good segue. Um, so I do have a few openings, and I, by a few, I mean I think I have one on each of these workshops. I think I actually have two on my January workshop, and I have one on each of the other ones that I have listed here. Um, and I'm running an online workshop. Uh, November 10th. Actually, I have a few spots open on that one. Um, but the online workshop is 10 days long, and I cover all of the all of the everything, like every single thing that I do to go into night shooting, all of the different ways that I chase light. Um, we edit every single day, so it's a t it's a 10 day long class. There's 90 minutes of class every day, and then I work with people one on one as well to edit their images or um, edit images that I provide. So I have an online workshop coming up. And then I have a ladies retreat. So this is ladies only at the end of November mm -hmm. and it's all winter, winter shooting. And then I have a winter wonderland type, uh, just <laughs> this is winter, winter, winter in the Canadian Rockies. And then I have, I think I have one spot on an Aurora and Milky Way chase workshop 
in March. So mm -hmm. they're kind of full, but if you want more information on my website, on my workshops, then you can go to my website, which is listed at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. We have a few, a few people in the chat that have uh, been in your workshops and they totally recommend it. Ah, oh, yay. Yeah, <laughs> Hi, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and another thing that I'm actually involved in right now that I encourage you to check out is I'm one of the judges on the Save a Star Astro 2021 Astro Competition. So, um, uh, it, Save a Star is a nonprofit foundation that is um, trying to preserve dark skies. I think that's a really worthy thing to learn about and to support. And to support that cause, they're running a competition for night photographers. And I think it's a really fun way to um, just participate in, in um, this move to preserve the night skies. So um, mm -hmm. you can check that out on Save a Star. Um, saveastar.org is it i can't remember what the, the end of it is but just search save a star astro 2021 and you will definitely find it definitely it's a great way to contribute to make this world a better place <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, yeah we're, uh, we're actually also sponsoring the the, the contest i'm inviting all the community for the plus community to awesome. also participate in yeah. this cause Yes, I know. I'm, and I'm excited about that. I think photo pills is a really good fit. Um, <laughs> just because, it's, like I said, guys, it's my favorite tool. It's the one tool I can't live without. And that's even after I've memorized so many of the values in there. But there's, it's always, you know, there's always something new to, to learn and to adapt. And um, I think photo pills is just a great tool for that. So I'm really glad to be, to have the opportunity to be here and speak about that. And um, Hopefully you find it interesting and helpful to know what goes on, you know, behind a single image, you know, days and days of planning and, and a lot of like fine detail work that goes into that. Um, and photo pills is a big part of my workflow. Definitely. And I can't wait to uh, have you uh, in Menorca next year. Oh, big, I'm big so surprise. excited about that. <laughs> Um, have you has that? I don't know if that's hit the the news yet, but I've been telling all of my friends that I'm going to be at Photo Phil's camp. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be amazing. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for for joining the the camp. Uh, next year is going to be a total total blast. I think like 14, 15 photographers uh, wow. joining us, and uh, it's going to be wow. great. And we open the enrollments very soon in you know, one week. So. What's that? Oh, you're opening registration in a week? Yeah, yeah. We're going to announce it this Saturday, uh, this sun mm -hmm. Sunday, I think, via email, mm -hmm. our newsletter, and then we'll open registrations via the priority list. Now we, uh, uh, people can... I'm sure I'm going to call out somebody by name here, but I'm sure you remember Vanessa Franking. Yeah, Vanessa is. Uh... It's coming. <laughs> so it's coming. She, she messaged me and she's like, I'm going to put up those camp. And why didn't you tell me you were going to be there? <laughs> getting after me, and I'm like, I literally just found out. So yeah, there's a lot of excitement on this end that I get to yeah, yeah. join you. Big surprise! Big surprise! Yeah. Uh, Rachel, we have a few questions. If you don't yes. mind answering them. Not at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have drawer or back. Do you focus stack manually in post using layers, or are you actually stacking images in camera? Um, so the Sony cameras don't do that in camera and I had set this up to show you guys and then I totally ran out of time. But what I've done here is I brought in my images. These are all the images that I took in that series. They're all stacked from front to back or back to front. I can't remember. So basically I would just select all of these layers and then I would go into edit and then auto align images and I would auto align the images first and I've already done that. So then I would just hit auto blend. Photoshop's pretty smart. It knows that I didn't do a panorama. I don't have 30% or more overlap from image to image. Um, I just have different focal points. So it automatically selects stack images for me. And right now I have seamless tones and colors selected. And that helps when the light changes a little bit from shot to shot, especially if you're doing like 30 second exposures and the lights coming up or going down. And then I just go ahead and hit OK. And Photoshop will create the masks and it'll give me like a final 
a final image that's all blended together. And it does a pretty good job. Um, there's other programs that do focus stacking. If you are a little bit hesitant to use Photoshop or Photoshop seems a little scary to you, um, there's a program called Helicon Focus. That's this icon down here. And it works well with Lightroom. So you can do the same thing. It has a, has a different algorithm. It works a little bit differently. Um, and they both have, you know, their uh, strengths and their weaknesses, but um, Photoshop is the one that I use most often. And if I can't get the results I'm looking for with Photoshop, I would try Helicon. But Photoshop's just, you know, such a big part of my workflow that um, I can typically mm -hmm. use this. We have another question from Dror Orbach. Uh, don't the stars move between the shots? Yes. So if you're stacking for noise reduction, um, the program I use for that is called Starry Landscape Stacker. And so what I would do is take 20 images and they're all going to be, they're all going to have the same interval. So it's going to be likely a one second interval. Again, my camera allows me to shoot very quickly. Uh, it's got a great processor in it. So then what happens is you put those 20 shots into Starry Landscape Stacker. I don't use Photoshop for that. And it has an algorithm that can calculate, you know, the distance between the stars or the time, and it, then you choose a base image. So let's say that in the, in the 20 shots, your Milky Way moved from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. You, so you could, choose, you could choose any position in those 20 shots to align the other images to with your, with your base image. So you choose an image that you want all of those 20 shots to align to, and the algorithm will calculate the movement of stars, and it gives you, gives you a single shot. And so noise from image to image is random. But the stars are going to move the same amount because you've set that interval. So you get the movement of the stars, which can be calculated, and, and that algorithm um, knows that that's stars. And that because the noise is random from image to image, it can subtract that out because that's the thing that isn't that isn't consistent. It's random. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Totally. Totally. <laughs> Intelligent program. Uh, next question. Uh, Niels Johnson, is the AS, A7S3 significantly better than the a7 S2. Mm. I would have to say yes. Um, there's a lot of technology that's gone into the A7 S3. I didn't shoot with the A7 S2. Um, I shot with the A7 S Mark I, the original. I still have, well, I still have one. So this is a story. I'll try and keep it short because I know I'm like super long today. But the A7S is where I started with in my Sony shooting. Like that's my first Sony camera. And I got it because I was photographing couples under the stars. I was doing engagement photos. And I really wanted something um, that would allow me to have short shutter times because people move and stuff like that. So I had the A7S. It's got a tiny little battery. It's the same battery as the A7S II. Um, it's a small, like it's a small camera and the battery is like half this size. So the mm -hmm. battery dies in the cold. <laughs> I did many shots where I would take a couple shots, put the battery back in my, like next to my warm body or my only slightly warm body. And then, you know, put the battery back in the camera and take two more shots before it died. And, you know, there was a lot of struggle with, with the smaller batteries. Um, but so that's, yeah, my whole night shooting started with the A7S and um, because of the battery issues and, and whatnot, and just like having moved to the R3, uh, and the R3 was not a struggle because it has the Z battery. I just, I was waiting a really long time for that A7S3 to come out. <laughs> and then it finally came out and we were in the middle of like a pandemic and I wasn't working and I was like, this is the worst possible timing for this thing. But anyways, um, yeah, this, I can't remember the original story I was going to tell you, but the, oh yeah, I now I remember. So I had this camera in my bag for a long time and I wasn't using it because I had two R3s and I had an A9 and whatever. So it was like camera number five and I sold it. And then like three months, I don't know, maybe four months later, the A7S three came out. So I had the A7S, I sold it after hanging onto it for like five years. And then the three came out like six months later. But in that, in that time period, between the time that I sold my original S 
and to the time that the A7S III came out, I had such deep regrets for letting it go, even though I didn't really use it very often, that I went and bought a, another one secondhand, like <laughs> I actually bought it from a friend. And so I had the A7S I again, and then the, then the three came out like two months later. So it was really funny. It was just <laughs> the timing of it all, of course. And now I haven't sold that one because, you know, the regrets were so deep from the first time I did it that, yeah, I just, I've kept it. But I don't use it right now because I use the, the three all the time. So, so just awesome, to go back Rachel. to that, that previous question, I'm just going to show you really quick here that the that Photoshop has completed this stacking and you can see it's sharp all the way from the front to mm -hmm. the back and there's no sort of weird wobbly edges or anything like that it did a really good job yeah. fantastic all I'm right here. okay Amazing. any any other questions no I think that's it um, okay I'm sorry I talked for so long I'm looking at the time <laughs> well <laughs> well, it's one hour and 35 uh, minutes and we still have uh, around 120 people with us. So okay, it's, awesome. uh, thank you so much, guys, for spending for all the time with us. <laughs> <laughs> no, your, your presentation has been, it's, it's been amazing. I really invite you guys, uh, you know, check uh, the online online workshop. It's super, super interesting. And what's the difference between uh, the online well, online and the, in the field workshops? Obviously, there's a big difference, but... What makes the online workshop so special? It's a pretty concentrated look at night photography. So, you know, when when people come and do workshops with me, we get different conditions and we're reacting to those conditions. Whereas the online thing, it's really structured. So it covers everything, you know, everything mm -hmm. from moonlight to twilight to Milky Way to Aurora to like anything we're going to encounter at night, even adding the human element to your scene. And then there's editing every single day. And I think that when you combine those two things, you combine the theory and the why with the actual how things come together. Then when people do go out to shoot, it makes more sense in their head because not only do they have the theory, but they know how it's gonna come together. And so when they get to a location, they can be like, oh, I already know I'm gonna have to focus stack this foreground. Um, this guy I can do as a single image or this guy I'm going to have to do as a stack and and stack it for noise reduction. So it kind of, yeah, it's the, the front side, the planning and the understanding and then the post. And then so when you go out to actually shoot, you have all that knowledge and you can put it into into practice. Awesome. I love it. I it's love the less concept. reactive. It's less reactive than when you when you go out and you do a workshop and you get a certain set of conditions and you're working with those particular conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you take it twice? Oh, can yeah. So it? actually, anybody that signs up for the online workshop, I leave it open so you can return as you can return six times if you want to. Um, it's okay. always open to my previous students. So um, if once you've taken it, and if I offer it again or when I offer it again, it's a matter of when, then you're welcome to join it a second time, as many times as you like. Sounds awesome. Yeah. And sometimes I have really great presenters like Rafa will come and guest speak <laughs> for me. Um, okay. I've had Epson come in and talk about how to prepare images for print. And this next round, I have Capture One actually coming in to talk about maybe using Capture One for part of this workflow. So that's a pretty cool. Nice. A pretty cool thing too and that changes from from session to session fantastic rachel thanks so much for this amazing presentation uh i'm reading the, the chat and people just love it awesome thank any final you. final words to share with the world i'm just really grateful that you guys all tuned in and listened to me talk for 95 yeah. minutes um thank you very much for that and just a shout out to some of the people that just amazingly support me, uh, Steve Milberg, if you're watching, mm -hmm. hi and thank you. And um, for all those people that, you know, spread the word about the talk today, thank you very much for doing that. Um, I just really appreciate the support. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here, Rafa. So, <laughs> well, have me anytime, back. <laughs> you know, mi casa, mi casa es su casa. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. And actually, we need to put together a, a workshop in 2023. Remember? Yeah, we are. So we already have dates for that. And it's going to be an Aurora and Milky Way chase. And you know, we're going to get really nerdy about the planning and the and the data that go for that. So 
you know, mm. if that's up your alley, you want to work with photo pills and me, oh, it's going to be in the Rockies. Yeah. Can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. Can't wait to freeze. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, okay. uh, watching this amazing class. Um, Thanks again uh, for being here with us. And uh, as always, if you like this video, this class, give us a like, subscribe. And I'll see you next Wednesday with another video. And tomorrow we have a, a really special a special class in Spanish, though, about photographing volcanoes. So feel free to join us, too, at 7 p.m. Spain time. And uh, that's it. Rachel. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks so for much. tuning in. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. And remember that you have the power to imagine, plan, and shoot legendary photos. Bye-bye. <laughs>